Sorry about that. There we go. Sorry about that. For all you folks online, sorry, you're going to have to ask somebody else what I said. <laughs> so if you will uh, turn in your Bibles, or you can take a look at the screen, and we'll have the scripture text available for you. <clears throat> I'm really glad to be back, and it's good to see familiar faces and some new faces, too. Um, if I remember right, I think it might have been the very last sermon that one of the kind of things that I had said that I was thinking like, oh, this might be controversial, but I said, okay, enough's enough. Let's all come back to church, right? And so I know that probably may have upset some people, but uh, you know, I still stick by those words. I'd say, all right, enough's enough. Let's come back to church. Let's enjoy the fellowship that we have uh, with our brothers and sisters. And with that, you know, some, maybe there's all these like, uh, you know, accounts just clicking off right now. They're like, okay, I don't want to hear this guy anymore after he said that. But, um, but I hope you will stick around, and I believe God's got something for us that is just so timely, and it's timeless, too, because, you know, it's something that Jesus said 2,000 years ago, and it still, you know, meets us right where we are today, right now. So, let's just get right into it. So, you know, over the last couple of years, you know, it's no, uh, nothing new. I'm not saying anything revolutionary here, that we've all gone through stuff together that is, is probably, uh, you know, more difficult, more challenging than anything, any season that we have experienced in our lifetime. You know, so while only one or two things of these things that we've experienced over the last couple of years, one or two things would just shake the foundation of our lives, of our daily lives, we've experience collectively a whole bunch of what I'll call fear factors. And the challenges of a global pandemic, you know, the widespread racial tensions, and there's, there, there's systematic supply chain issues we keep hearing about, and wave after wave of geopolitical intrigue. And then, you know, then it's compounded by, you all know it, go to the gas station, go to the grocery store, every, economic instability. Maybe it's in the workplace, and, and then that doesn't even include, like, what are we experiencing when we're all by ourselves? Maybe it's a sadness or loneliness or depression, feelings of inadequacy, feeling like we're failures, all these things that are just weighing on us. And while worry and fear are going to try and seize this opportunity to lead and control our lives, Jesus invites us to authentic faith in God. To not be ruled by fear and worry, but that our lives would be ruled by faith in God. And one of the principal ways that we express our faith on a day-to-day -day level is in the way that we pray. And so today's passage, Jesus has something to say to us about prayer. So why don't we begin with prayer? Father God, thank you so much that you invite us to come and speak with you, to meet with you, to know you, have relationship, fellowship with you. And sometimes, God, the reality is we don't know what to do once we are with you. And so would you today speak to us and teach us how do we relate to you? Who are you? And teach us, Lord, how to pray. Just as the disciples asked Jesus, your son, the very first time, we ask, joining the generation after generation of, of disciples who have said, teach us how to pray. And it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So God, our Father, in Jesus Christ, is going to reveal himself today. I, I believe that. So let's be ready to receive what he has for us. So we go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. We're in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, Jesus' famous sermon. And this is what he says in chapter 6 of Matthew, verses 5 through 8. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. I should give you the passage. There it is. Do not be like the hypocrites. 
For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So while this passage from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount might look like, okay, it's his instructions on prayer. And it is. It is his instructions on prayer. But it's more. The whole Sermon on the Mount, I submit to you, is really Jesus' sermon on what does it mean to have a real relationship with God. Because how we pray reveals the one to whom we pray. How we pray reveals our relationship to the one to whom we pray. And third, how we pray reveals what we believe about the one to whom we pray. So here, Jesus first approaches the subject from the negative, and then he's going to go back and forth between positive, negative, positive. So he starts and he says in verse 5, and when you pray, here's the negative, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. Simply don't pray like hypocrites. Don't pray like those who have all the wrong reasons, all the wrong motives for praying. Don't do it for show. Don't do it to keep up appearances, not even for the appearance of spirituality. Don't pray so that people think you're godly. Don't pray just so that people can say, wow, look at that relationship they have with God. Look how close they are with God. Because that's how the hypocrites pray. They are people who have little and maybe no relationship to God. Yet they want to suggest, and they, they're, they're, you could say they're, they're all about this hustle. I want everybody to think I'm something I'm not. Remember, we are speaking to our Father in heaven. And what does Jesus say next? And this ought to be a, a shock, a surprise for those who have settled for that kind of communication and relationship with God. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. Why is that a shock? Why is it like a punch in the stomach for those who would pretend act like they are spiritual, who are acting like they're talking with God. Because let's, uh, let's, let's unpack something here. You know, Jesus often points to a, an absurdity so that he can show us what's so obviously true. And what's the absurdity here? I mean, think about it. What is the purpose of prayer? If we go back to Sunday school, and I don't know if you guys learned this. I learned this in VBS in Sunday school. Hey, you know, if you don't know how to pray, consider using this acronym, the ACTS of Prayer. A stands for adoration. C stands for confession of your sins. T for thanksgiving and gratitude to God for what he has done for us. And then S, supplication, which means asking God what we need, our supply. So think about it. If you're a hypocrite and you pray great words, beautiful words of worship and adoration to God, sing wonderful songs to him, but you're doing it for show, or you confess your sins, but you're not doing it because you want God to know that you're repenting, you're admitting to your flaws, but you just want people to think like, wow, Look how godly he is, how humble he is. He's confessing his sin. And if you're thanking God for all that he's done for you, but you're not really talking to God, you're talking to the people, or if you are presenting this long list of all your needs, and we all have long lists of needs, 
but we don't bring it to the one who can actually supply us. How ridiculous is that? When the opportunity is right there, the invitation is there, come, come, let's hang out, let's fellowship together, let's, let's have a personal one-on-one -on -one appointment together. And then instead of taking advantage of such an amazing opportunity, an invaluable, such a priceless opportunity to be spending time with the God of the universe, the creator, our heavenly father. Instead, we're spending time with the people so we can show off. We have failed to do the very thing, the most important thing, the very purpose of prayer, we have not communicated with God. We have not spent time with God. Instead, we receive our reward in full. And what is that? That somebody might pat you on the back and say like, boy, aren't you a good Christian? Aren't you spiritual? And what good is it to receive that reward? What is that compared to the reward of spending real time with God. Then Jesus declares, truly they have received their reward in full. People have seen them. People have congratulated them, approved them, thought highly of them, respected them. But if we're going to do that, why would we do that? But if we're going to do that, why not, why do we go to church if, if it's not just a you know, be able to put on our calendar, like, check, we are at church. Look at our attendance record. Or why would we carry a Bible just so people would say, like, wow, look at that. That guy still carries a Bible. All I carry is my phone. Or why would we, you know, teach or preach or serve or lead just so that people can say, great job. When the opportunity is there, to receive a greater reward from our Heavenly Father. So then he pivots to the positive in verse 6, and he says, instead, pray like this. But when you pray, in verse 6, go into your room, close the door. I'm going to go back here so you can have the passage again. I, oops, sorry, it, the, uh, I think the app froze. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. You know, I had a brother that if you would ask him to pray during worship service or in a Bible study or in a meeting or before a meal, he'd say, no, 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 John, I, I don't do that because citing this very passage, Jesus says we should pray in secret. Well, Friends, I hope we can all agree that Jesus, in saying what he is saying here, is not prohibiting public prayer or vocalized prayer. He's not saying the only way to pray is in a closet or in secret, but that he is emphasizing the opportunity we have that we can have an intimate relationship with God, a one-to-one -one almost like a secret relationship with God. And you know what we do, right? When we know that we have, that somebody is going to be, um, you know, they're going to value a secret that we share. They're going to guard the secret. We know we can say anything. When we're with somebody we trust, somebody we love, and, and we're close right next to them, and we can whisper into each other's ear, we know we can say anything, and it's safe. We don't have to hide we don't have to pretend. We don't have to put up some kind of air of, oh, you know, I'm, I'm actually better than I really am. No, we can be completely honest, revealing everything. And Jesus says, you can be that way with God. You can be that way with God. Going into a secret place. You see, God is not a disinterested God. He is not aloof and far away. He is our Father who invites us to come near to him, who invites us to seek him out and then promises us that we're going to find him. 
that he's not like trying to be evasive. You know, you ever get ghosted by somebody? I get that happens to me. I know it's, you'd think like, yeah, how could that happen to this guy? He's so he seems like such a likable guy. No, I get ghosted all the time, and I'm like, man, I know how text messages work. He just got that message. Why? Why isn't he answering right? So you just hope they're probably in a meeting. They can't answer right now. God's not going to ghost us. He doesn't get tired of his children and say, you know, oh gosh, this guy, he won't stop talking. He always wants to hang out with me. God's not that kind of a father. He loves it when we spend time with him. He wants us to come closer and closer, to know him better. Because remember, we're speaking with our Heavenly Father. I hope we all believe this, that this is the God that invites us to come near, to pray. He's intimately close. He loves us. And he, and he, in fact, the Bible says he loves us so much that his own Holy Spirit has made our bodies his temple, his home. That he says that we are to abide, have unity with his son. And then he tells us we're so close that nothing can separate us from his love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, that's close. And this is the Father to whom we pray. And as in a secret place, we can enjoy un paralleled, uninhibited access to the Father so that this reward of knowing him is, not, is so much greater than that meager reward you get when you pray for the sake of what people might think. Sure, there's stuff that comes with this reward. You know, we bring our lists and we say, God, please help me. Please provide for me. I have this need. And sure, God takes care of material needs too. But my, that, that's like, you know, having a steak and saying like, man, this is the most awesome salt I've ever had. There's something even better than the stuff that God provides. It's himself. It's himself. So let's not let the stuff that is good distract us from what's really the best. It's God himself, the Father. So in verse 7, then he says, well, uh, let's say, you know, the authentic relationship with the Father requires us to believe who he is. And actually, it requires us to believe who we are, too. That when we pray... We're not praying as strangers or the enemies of God, but in Christ Jesus, we are his children. We are talking to Daddy God, Abba Father. So we had to know who he is. We got to know who we are. And then when we pray, it also includes knowing what kind of father is he. So in verse 7, Jesus says, And when you pray, going to back to the negative, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think they'll be heard because of their many words. So what kind of father is he? The first thing we see is he's not the kind of father who's really impressed by lots of words. Words by themselves don't do it for him. You know, in many religions, including many traditions of Christianity, you know, writing down prayers, reading prayers, memorizing and reciting prayers, and even praying a long time. These are valuable things, highly valued things. And don't, just like we're not going to do Bible studies anymore, it doesn't mean there's no more prayer meetings either, okay? <laughs> By the way, we are going to have Bible studies, right, Pastor Mark? And yes, we should pray. So these are all still valuable. Yes, write down your prayers. Journal your prayers because, you know, you're going to come back one day when you're really discouraged and you're going to go back and read your journal and go, man, I totally forgot about this. Six months ago, I was so depressed that I answered, asked God, Lord, would you please give me joy and peace? Would you give me contentment? 
And I have it, and I totally forgot I asked him. And then you can write next to your little prayer that you wrote down, God did it. He came through. How faithful he is. And then we'll worship him. So write them down. Recite prayers. Memorize prayers. Because sometimes, you know, you know this experience, you get to your quiet time, your prayer closet, and you're, you're just like, Man, I don't even know what to say to God today. So what do you do? You might go back and read the prayers of others. That's valuable. And then sometimes you want to discipline yourself and say, you know what, I, am not, I don't have much to say, but I am not leaving this room until I have prayed 10 minutes or 15 minutes, until I've talked to God for half an hour or prayed for an hour or more. Those are great disciplines. But even those valuable things can become empty and void of value and meaning if we're not careful. Let me give you an example. You know, when I was a small boy, you know, I probably learned from my parents more than anybody else how to pray. And one day when my dad would hear me saying the same things over and over again in prayer, like at the dinner table, he said, hey, why don't you kind of mix it up a little bit and be more creative? Because it doesn't sound like you mean it when you say it. So he said, for example, maybe you might want to start with not just, you know, thanks for the food, God, but you might say, thank you, God, for a beautiful day. Thank you for taking care of me. And, you know, so he would provide these suggestions. And I remember thinking, yeah, that's a great idea. So I added in my prayers, God, thank you for this beautiful day. As a child, that just like, hey, that's simple. That makes sense. And, but I remember I was in elementary school, and I was praying over my cereal and milk. And I remember praying, God, thank you for this beautiful day. And immediately, I looked out the window and noticed it was dark, it was raining, it looked cold, and here I was thanking God for a beautiful day. And immediately I realized, like, man, I just said something I don't even mean. Unless, you know, even as a kid, I was super spiritual, like, I'm praying for a beautiful day. I'm believing God's going to give it to me, you know, I or, I, or I'm so spiritual, I'm going to be content as I'm getting soaking wet and freezing in the rain. No. Even something that was meant to be good had become meaningless because it was just words. And you know what I'm talking about because I'm sure you've experienced that too. And we've got to check ourselves. And sometimes it's even the, the very name of God, the calling God Lord, you know, have you ever had, it, I mean, sorry, this isn't in the notes. Have you ever had one of those conversations with somebody? Wouldn't it be annoying if I was talking to Mark and I said, hey, Mark, how's your day, Mark? Mark, you want to go out for lunch, Mark? <laughs> is, is Wendy doing okay, Mark? Are your kids doing okay, Mark? And if I kept saying his name over and over again, and you know what? If you think about it, that's how we often pray, right? Like, Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful day, Lord. And then, Lord, and, th and then now you're all going to get really self-conscious about public prayer or something. But, like, even Lord, that he is the master of all things, king, and it becomes meaningless. It's just another word. Because we don't mean it when we say it. Or Father, or maybe even the name of Jesus it just becomes something that we automatically insert into every sentence at the beginning, in the middle, at the end, you know, as if somehow, like the pagans think, that their many words are going to get God to hear them. And God is not a respecter of lots of words. So when we pray, let's pray, meaning what we say and saying what we mean. And here's another thing. You know, God is not like other gods. And he's not, you know, though he is our father, he is not like our earthly father. And here's what I mean. How many parents do we have in this room? Well, we got a young room, not, not a lot of parents. <laughs> Two parents. Well, when you're parents, you're going to experience this. And this is where your children will negotiate. Well, you, we've all been children, so maybe we remember when we've done this, that we negotiate with our parents. That we might even say things like adore them, love them, flatter them, like worship and praise them, just so we can get what we want. 
God's not like that. We don't adore him, confess our sins, and thank him just so we can hurry up and get to the list of things that we need, thinking that if we butter him up, if we get him in a good mood, he's going to give us what we need and what I want. Or we might bargain, God, if you'll do this for me, I'll do this for you. You know what my favorite one is? God, if you make me rich, I promise I will start to tithe. <laughs> Give me a million dollars, and I promise I'll start to tithe. And you know how ridiculous that is? It's like, God, give me a million dollars, and I promise I'll give you 100000 back. What a great deal for God, right? But that's how we pray sometimes. We're thinking we're doing him a favor in these deals. Let's not do that. That's not the kind of God we serve. That's not the Heavenly Father. Are we using many words, strategic words, insincere words, maybe even empty words because we're forgetting who we're talking with, who we're dealing with, that he's not impersonal, he's not an absentee father, but rather we are speaking to our heavenly father who loves us. Yes, we believe our God is our father, but do we really believe what kind of God he is? And then Jesus reminds us again, he doesn't respect words because that's because that's he's not an empty God. He's not a dead God who receives empty prayers from empty prayers. So he says in verse 7 again, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Second, though, we have to remember that our Father is one who already knows what we need. In other words, when we give our list of needs, God's not like, wow, here's information I did not have. I'm so glad he gave me a detailed list. Or it's not like time goes by and, you know, we forget to tell God we need something. It's like, and God says, oh, man, why didn't you tell me you needed that? I would have taken care of it. But you never told me. I had no idea that was going on in your life. I didn't know. God is a father who already knows what we need. You know, in a season when our prayer life can become very imbalanced, you know, when, when it seems like there's so many needs, that the list at the end becomes the large part of our prayer, that we kind of rush through praising and worshiping him. We rush through sincerely confessing our sins and asking for forgiveness, where we rush through and try, you know, have a hard time remembering what has God done for me lately? I got to thank him for something. I got to come up with something just so I can get to the list. Let's not forget what kind of God, what kind of father is he? That he is one who knows what we need. And in knowing what we need, we have a God who is able, he is capable of providing what we need. Do we believe that? Amen? Amen. This side doesn't sound convinced. Amen? Does he, can he take care of us? Yes. But here's something that's equally important. Yes, he is able to take care of us. The Bible tells us he is a king that owns cattle on a thousand hills. I mean, maybe that, like in today's vernacular, that might be like he's a car dealer who owns a thousand lots of cars, you know. If you need a car, he's got one for you, Okay. By the way, I don't know how many times God has provided a car when I've desperately needed a car. And others have said the same thing to me. But not only can he do it, but what's equally important is that he is gracious. He cares. He loves us, so he wants to do it. He wants 
to take care of us. He wants to bless us. He doesn't want us to go without. He wants to bless us. He wants to make sure that he is supplying us. These two things, it might seem obvious, but these things, these two things in combination are so incredibly important. You see, if he was a powerful and wealthy God, he would, it would be like having a father who is a, a billionaire, but he never asks, hey, did you have lunch today? Hey, your whole, your, there's holes in your clothes. Do we need to get you a new shirt? Hey, um, you look sad today. How can I help you today? It would be having a God who is a billionaire, who has everything that a person could want or have, and then, but they don't care about us. They won't lift a finger to help us. But what if God was unable to help us, but he really cared about us? And that was all he, you know what? That would be like the impotent father who desperately sees, their, sees his desperate children starving to death, freezing in the cold, having no roof over their heads, no bed to sleep in, and because he's powerless, he's helpless, he can do nothing. But God is able and he so cares about us. There's no place I see it better than in the words of Paul. I got to ask, sister, I don't know if you read the sermon manuscript before, uh, you know, I preached today, but here she quoted the very verses. In Romans 5, 6 through 8, Paul says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, you know, helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. And here it is in verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Our Father knew exactly what we needed more than anything else. We had a problem that was the elephant in the room. We could not get past it. We could not ignore it. It is a sin problem that we have offended our Heavenly Father, our Creator. And God had the solution because we were helpless, powerless to do anything about it. And the solution was in His Son. And God could say, oh, no, no, wait, the price is way too high. I cannot give up my son for these losers. They're my enemies. Why would I sacrifice my son for them? But he didn't do that because he demonstrated his love for us like this. That while we were still sinners, still his enemies, he gave his son Jesus died for us. Amazing. This is amazing love, the song that we sang. This is amazing. We needed a Savior. The Father was able to provide a Savior. And because he loves us and cares for us, he was willing to pay the price, that high price, so that we could be saved from our sin. Jesus' words on prayer reinforce for us that God desires an authentic relationship with us. Not just religiosity, not just piety, not just ritualism. He wants a relationship. Come close to me. Come close. Come even closer. You're still too far away. Come closer. And he gives us access 
through faith in Jesus Christ, his son. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, why wait a moment longer? Trust in him today. He said himself, no one comes to the Father except through him. I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads for a moment. And I'm going to ask you to... We'll just go through the acts, the acts of prayer. God, thank you that you are indeed a loving Father. Thank you that you are a God who is powerful and you are able. We don't have a weak God. We don't have a distant God. We have a God who is intimately close. A God who doesn't have to hang out with us, but God who wants to. We praise you for being a God like no other, for being our Heavenly Father. And we confess our sin to you. We admit that we have sinned against you when we have tried to live life our own way. God, we have said no to you. We have said your way is not good enough. Your way isn't good enough for me. It's not my way. And we have chosen to rebel. And we ask you for forgiveness for every choice that we have made, which only confirmed that we are in rebellion against you. But Lord, thank you that you have sent your son, Jesus, knowing exactly what we need, a Savior. You have provided a Savior, the perfect Lamb of God in your son, Jesus Christ. And you have said to us, if we will just believe in your remedy for our sin problem, the solution to our sin problem, if we would just receive in faith that remedy that you have said, you will forgive us. You'll give us a new life, a new identity, no longer an enemy of God, but now a child of God, a friend of God. That you promise us eternal life and not death. Thank you for the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we do lay before you all our needs, and we, we know that we're going to keep being tempted. We're going to keep being distracted. We're going to think that things that are fool's gold is real gold. We're going to think that what isn't valuable is valuable. Our, our priorities are going to get messed up, and we need your help, Lord. Teach us. Teach us how to get it right. We can't do it without your help. And there are other needs in this room. Financial needs, concerns about career or education, relational issues, broken families, broken friendships, broken relationships with in our workplaces, in our schools, Lord, with this world, we pray you will heal those relationships. And God, we also ask, again, that you would teach us how to pray. Because we want to have that relationship with you, that communication with you, that Jesus has now, you know, he's wet our appetite and has shown us, like, how much better how much more there is for us. Lord, teach us how to pray. And I'm going to ask you to open your eyes for a moment. <clears throat> and we're going to finish prayer this way. Because Jesus did give us a specific prayer. And it's probably one that everybody in the room has memorized. But how many times when somebody says, okay, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together, we're able to just you know, we could be like texting somebody and we could still do the Lord's Prayer, right? We could be watching a video, YouTube, and we're, we can do, recite the Lord's Prayer. But how about right now, we'll just focus, pull away from all the distractions, and let's, let's look at the Lord's Prayer, the, the prayer that Jesus taught us afresh. Because he said, this then is how you should pray. 
Let's do it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And Jesus invites us to an authentic relationship with his heavenly Father. And I ask you, do you accept that invitation? Are you all in on this relationship? I hope your answer is a resounding yes, absolutely, that's what I want. So it's in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen.